Stories stick in your mind. You'll remember a good story over a fact, over a theory. In fact, you'll remember stories above everything else. But why? In this episode, you'll learn why stories are so memorable and how businesses can tell a good story. All of that coming up, but first, here's a podcast I'd recommend. Marketing Made Simple, hosted by Dr. JJ Peterson, is a wonderful show brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Now, Marketing Made Simple is a show that I've appeared on. It's fantastic. It brings you practical tips that help you make your marketing easy and, more importantly, make it work. There's one episode I would like to recommend out of the many good episodes on there, and it is an episode on how to write and deliver a captivating speech. On the show, they give you this step-by-step process that you can follow to write and deliver a speech that provides real value, but also provides the power to convert a large audience into valuable customers. So go and check out Marketing Made Simple wherever you get your podcast. Podcasts. We're going to kick off today's episode of Nudge with a test. Ready? Okay. First question Can you explain what Pythagoras's theory is? Feel free to pause and have a think. How well do you think you can explain it? My bet is you're probably not too solid on explaining this theory. It's been a while since we've learned about it in school. Um, and unless you're a maths teacher, you probably don't have a good explanation to hand. Okay. Second and final question. What happens in the story of the Good Samaritan? Again, pause and have a think. So my hypothesis is that more of you, at least, will have a vague idea of the story of the Good Samaritan, but very little of you will be able to explain what Pythagoras' theory is. But why? What is it about the Good Samaritan story that makes it so memorable? Well, it is quite visceral. The Jewish traveller in the story is stripped, beaten and left half dead. It's a little heartbreaking. The first two travellers who meet him ignore him. And finally, it has a happy ending. The Samaritan, despite apparently his people despising Jews all the time, stopped and helped the injured Jew. We'll get into what makes a good story later, but I don't think there's anything specific about the good Samaritan story that makes it more memorable than Pythagoras' theorem. We don't remember it because it's a good story. We simply remember it because it is a story. See, I'd bet that most Western educated children spent more time in their lives learning about Pythagoras than they did reading or hearing about the Good Samaritan. Hours and hours were spent in the maths classroom studying Pythagoras, and I doubt, at least for me, I spent even one-tenth of the time reading, learning or studying about the Good Samaritan story. And yet, I remember that story. And turns out, others do as well. I surveyed 800 people via Google surveys and found which of those two things, Pythagoras' theorem or the Good Samaritan story, people remembered well enough to explain. 32% of people said the Good Samaritan. Which begs the question, what is it about stories that makes them so memorable? Well, the answer is fairly simple. We have a literal story bias. Our brains have evolved in a way that simply makes stories stick in our minds. Research suggests that stories activate your brain's sensory processing center. When your sensory center activates, it gives you a shot of oxytocin, which generates positive feelings of compassion, empathy, and trust. On the other hand, hard facts and theory, like Pythagoras' theorem, activate the data processing center in your brain, which doesn't trigger your brain in the same way meaning for most of us at least, remembering these facts and theories is much, much harder. There's some solid evidence to back this up. Psychologist Daniel Stern ran some fascinating studies which show how stories can help us remember random events even years after they have passed. For his study, he took a set of children participants into a room. While they waited for the researcher to arrive, the fire alarm went off and the children had to evacuate. It was just a test fire alarm and 10 minutes later the children were brought back into the room and split into two groups. Now the first group were told to make a story out of the fire alarm going off to create a narrative around their day and to make that fire alarm a major part of the story. The other group didn't do that. They simply answered a few general questions and weren't asked about the fire alarm again. So one group walks away with the fire alarm experience and a good story around it while the other group just walks away with the experience of the fire alarm. No story. Psychologist Daniel Stern followed up with these children seven years later. 
So he waited seven years and then asked both groups again what did they remember from that day. And it turns out the group of children who created a story around the fire alarm were far more likely to remember that fire alarm. Simply making a story out of something can dramatically improve our memory, making insignificant events stick in the mind for seven years. Not only are stories more memorable though, but they also make events seem more compelling and believable. In another experiment on the story bias, Harvard psychologist Ellen Langer went into a library and waited at a photocopier until a line had formed. So she was standing away from the photocopier, looking at the photocopier, waiting for a line to form. Obviously, this this study was a while ago. It was when photocopiers were actively used. Now, once there was a line, she approached the first person in the line and said, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine? Her success rate here was 60%. So six out of 10 people said, yeah, you can cut in front of me. Four out of 10 people said, no way, go to the back of the line. She repeated the experiment, this time giving a short story explaining why she was cutting in. She said, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use a Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? So a bit of explanation, a bit of a story behind why she wants to cut in. And now, in almost all cases, in 94% of cases, she was allowed to cut ahead. This is kind of understandable. If people are in a hurry, you, you'll let them cut to the front of the line. When you use a story, even a small one, to justify your behaviour, you encounter more tolerance and more helpfulness. I'm sure all of us can remember times in our own lives when this has happened. When we hear a story justifying a behaviour, we find that behaviour more acceptable. I remember waiting for a train to get to work one morning. It was 15 minutes late, I was really stressed out, I was worried I'd miss my 9am meeting, the platform was getting busier and I'd probably struggle to get my preferred seat which meant I wouldn't be able to get my laptop out and prepare for my presentation and then over the tannoy I heard an announcement. The station manager said, sorry about the delay, the driver of the next train was 15 minutes late into work this morning but he's got a good reason, he's just become the father to a little baby boy, he's come straight from the hospital to drive your train and this explanation completely changed my perception. I went from agitated to calm. Smiles broke out amongst the other commuters and I didn't worry as much about my 9am meeting. A story can reassure and calm you and it's much better than being kept in the dark. Where possible, businesses should use this story bias. Don't say your taxi is running late. Say it's the worst traffic you've seen in London since before the pandemic. Don't say we serve fresh fish. Say the local fisherman Bill caught it around 5am this morning. Organisations can use stories like this to make their message more believable, but also make their brand more memorable. And it can be used to make a product seem more appealing. To explain all, I invited expert brand marketer and storyteller Dr JJ Peterson on Nudge. JJ is co-author of the book Marketing Made Simple and host of the Marketing Made Simple podcast. He's head of the agency Story Brand, where he's helped hundreds of brands come up with a better story for their products and services. To start off, JJ told me the number one thing every brand, every marketer, every entrepreneur needs to know when creating their story. Most companies, when they think about a brand story, what they're trying to do is tell their own story right? How do we communicate our story well? And your brand story should not be about you. It should actually be your customer story. The best way to connect with customers is not to tell your story, it's to tell their story. And it's to invite customers into a story really where they are the hero of the story and you are the guide. Right. So they are Luke Skywalker. You are Obi-Wan Kenobi and you are helping them win the day. And the reason why that's important is because all of us wake up every day as the hero of our own story. And if I'm the hero of my story and a company is a hero of their story, well, now we are in competing stories and we actually, you have to win and I have to lose in order for this story to end well. We're in competing stories. And If you position yourself as a guide in my story as a customer, then you are helping me win the day. Now, this is classic value-based marketing, right? Don't sell a six-part fitness video series. Sell six-pack abs in just six weeks. Don't sell fried chicken. Sell an overdue family meal with your son and his new partner. And don't sell a £500 return ticket to Orlando. Sell memories with your daughter that will last a lifetime. Most of us know this. I've shared this on the podcast before and shared why language that highlights the value your customer will get performs better than shouting about your product benefits. 
But I want to know what makes a good story, what makes some stories better than others, and if there is any particular rule to storytelling that all of us should follow. JJ broke all of that down for me, and it wasn't what I had expected. Hear what he shared after this quick break. Now, as marketers, we are driven to solve problems. There are problems that can be really fun to solve, like finding new ways to connect with your audience or brainstorming your latest ad campaign. But then there are problems that are just plain frustrating, like when your ad tech doesn't work like it's supposed to, which means you can't measure how well that brilliant new campaign is performing. Fortunately, the HubSpot CRM platform is here to help. It's really easy to learn and use, and that's because it's a handcrafted, sophisticated system designed for the ways that marketers actually work, not just a bunch of cobbled together tools that don't speak to one another. With customizable hubs and tools that you can add or subtract as you grow, HubSpot is ready to help you squash endless problems caused by broken tech and start solving problems that help your campaigns really perform well. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. Okay, back to the show. Here's JJ explaining what makes a good story. Yeah, you want to tell the same story and over, over and over and over again. The more people hear your story, the more they memorize it and see themselves in the story. And that's really actually the key to all of this is uh, I'll get a little nerdy here. So my PhD is in narrative theory and narrative marketing. And this all comes down to a principle called narrative transportation. So there's a, a studies that show that when people encounter a good story, when they see a good story, they actually see themselves in that story. They experience what's called narrative transportation. And what we mean by a good story, there's actually 15 points that are judged on whether a story is effective with narrative transportation or not. Two really key pieces to making sure the story is good is fidelity and coherency. Does the story stick together? So every time they hear it, is it the same? Does it stick together? And does it make sense? So the more a story is sticks together and makes sense, has fidelity and coherency, the more people will achieve narrative transportation. So they will see themselves in the story. Then the research goes further and says, that the more people experience narrative transportation, the more influence that story has over their thoughts and their actions. So the better the story, the more clear, consistent story, the more people will see themselves in the story, and then the more that will impact their thoughts and actions. And we ha- we know that narrative transportation happens when we watch a movie, right? If you've ever jumped in a movie when something is scary or you cried or you laughed or just were moved, that you experienced narrative transportation. That happened. And whether you know it or not, that story then begins to have influence in your life. But the research shows that that doesn't just happen in books and movies. It actually happens in marketing, When people can see themselves in the story, it has more influence over their life. Then people will experience narrative transportation at a higher level, and therefore the story will have a greater influence over them engaging with your product and service. Fidelity and coherency, two traits of a memorable story. Studies have shown that people need to see a message at least seven times before it sinks in. So it's really vital that your story stays the same over that period. If it changes, you'll lose that memorability before the audience even has a chance to remember your message. You see this a lot with startups. They spend a lot of money branding their product only to change their design, their copy or their website after just a few months. Marketers might say this is to keep up with the speed of the market or to appeal to a new audience, but it's probably only harming your existing memorability. Another problem both startups and bigger businesses have is chucking way too much information into their messaging, reducing its fidelity. Research by Millwood Brown looked at how memorable a message was on its own and compared it to when a message was shared with two or three or four other messages. For example, your message might be that deodorant is the best at reducing sweating. However, when you combine that message with another message, like it leaves no white marks, memorability drops by 45 points. 
When you combine it with a third message saying half price off this month, memorability drops by a further three points. This is memorability for the whole brand, by the way, not just those individual messages, but for any of those messages. And when you add a fourth message, like derived from an ancient Mayan herbal deodorant recipe, then the memorability of any one of those messages drops by a further 19 points. All in all, sharing just one message compared to sharing four makes the message two times more memorable. Fidelity and coherency are vital traits for making a story more memorable. I asked JJ if there was anything else marketers should be aware of and if there's anything that can ruin a good story. Another way people break narrative transportation is when they're not sticking to a story, but they're just trying to say like sell a product. So let's say you have this very emotional commercial where a father and son are reuniting because they've been distant and the father did all the work to like get back into the son's life and good graces. And then at the very end, they show you a whiskey bottle with a label on it and kind of take you out of the story, right? So (laughs) there are other ways that people can be taken out of narrative transportation as far as like if you don't stick to the story and add in other details or you jump timelines, like the timeline doesn't make sense. Or if you are in, say like you're in a movie, you are saying in the movie and the story that you are flying out of London Heathrow And actually, when I'm watching that movie, I know that that's Gatwick, right? If I know that that's not the airport you're telling me, then I'm taken out of the story. So there's other ways, but a lot of it really just comes down to fidelity and coherency. Does the story stick together and does it make sense? And if you can do that, then you're actually going to have more influence over people who are watching your story. JJ is exclusively talking about visual stories here, and in researching this episode, I learned how important imagery is in memorability. Now, this is a little scary for me to share as a podcaster, but visuals make something much more memorable. Stuart Sutherland, in his book Irrationality, shares that most of us have an amazing capacity to remember pictures. In one study, participants were shown 10,000 photographs just once. And then a week later, they were shown 20,000 photographs, and they were asked which of the photographs they had seen before. Almost all participants correctly recalled every single photo they saw. That's right, you can recall 10,000 photos a week later. This, This blew my mind, because I wouldn't have expected it to be true, but we really have this incredible memory for pictures. And this is in marked contrast to the very poor memorability we have for isolated words. If you're picking between words and imagery, images will win every time. So next time you're writing an email, crafting a tweet, preparing a presentation, make sure you spend just as much time creating the right imagery as you do coming up with the right words, because the images, well, they will be the thing that is remembered. According to Rolf Dobelli in his book, The Art of Thinking Clearly, this is why for 18 years, the American media was prohibited from showing pictures of soldiers' coffins. No one, not a national newspaper or a one-person blogger, was allowed to share an image of a soldier's coffin. And then in 2009, the Defence Secretary Robert Gates lifted this ban and images of soldiers' coffins were allowed on the internet. Officially, family members have to give their approval before anything is published, but that rule is pretty much unenforceable. So why was this ban created in the first place? Well, it was because the military knew how memorable those images would be. Stats about the number of soldiers dying would quickly fade from the memory, but a few dozen images of coffins draped in the American flag will grip the Americans' interest and would stick in their minds for years, maybe making them overestimate the size of the war and overestimate the number of fallen soldiers. This got me thinking, where does our understanding of the story bias come from? Is it a fairly new discovery? Fidelity, coherency and imagery, three rules behind compelling storytelling. But what else is there to know? Here's JJ explaining that storytelling isn't anything new and how Plato and Socrates have told us how to make a good story. There are actually rules to story. So story has been studied, you know, all the way back to even, you know, Plato and (laughs) Socrates, you know, where they were saying, they actually argued, this is a little off topic, but I'll keep going with it, um, is that they actually showed that if you wanted to impact the masses, that you should use comedy. And if you wanted to impact the elite, you should use drama. Comedy is aimed at the masses. 
drama is aimed at the elite because drama is based on status, your ability to gain or lose status, which is why we have television shows that uh, drama television shows are about police officers and politicians and doctors and lawyers and comedy shows are about the everyman and the fool <laughs> because that's where they're targeting. And so when you actually want to move people to action, uh, you know, Aristotle and Plato would say that you have to actually use those forms in order to influence people. And they would, ar- they argued in poetics, the best way to change a culture is through story. So e- this, this is not new. It's not that all of a sudden we discovered stories are really good at influencing people. This goes all the way back. The story bias isn't a new finding. It's been well known for 2,500 years. Comedy influences the masses, drama influences the elite. But how can you make sure your comedic or dramatic story is even read in the first place? Well, this is a question that authors have pondered for thousands of years. Every author wants to write a book that people read. So every author wants to give their book a title that makes it tempting enough to open and buy. Back in the 1920s, one author decided to test just this. He wanted to know exactly what type of titles, book titles, drove sales. He was the book mail order guru, Holderman Julius, and he really was the master at creating titles that sold books. During the 1920s and 30s, he sold more than 200 million books in nearly 2,000 different titles. Now, he was selling very simple little books. All of them cost just five cents each. And to advertise his books, he would place adverts in the newspaper. The ads would only show the book's title. If a book didn't sell well, he knew it was down to the title. So he had changed the book's actual title, republished the ad, and see if the book sold better. That is commitment to marketing, right? If his book didn't sell, he would actually go and change the title after publishing it to get better sales. After making the change, he'd sit back and study the results. Julius was an A-B testing marketer from around 100 years ago. Now, there are five great examples of how tweaking his titles dramatically changed sales. And I'll tell you what the titles were and how they were tweaked and how it increased sales. So one of his books was called 10 O'Clock and it sold just 2,000 copies. He changed the title to What Art Should Mean to You and it sold 9,000 copies, four times more. His book, The Art of Controversy, sold zero copies originally, and he changed the title to How to Argue Logically, and it sold 30,000. The book called Apophems sold just 2,000 copies. He changed the title to The Truth About the Riddle of Life, and it sold 9,000. According to Holderman Julius, the best way to title your book was to appeal to self-improvement. A story that hints on how much you as the reader will improve is much more alluring than one that just introduces a general topic. Take a look at any non-fiction bestseller and you will see modern day authors applying this same bias. Self-improvement titles sell. Oh, and there was one more thing that made Julius's books sell. It was adding sex in the title. Casanova and his loves sold 8,000 copies. When Julius changed it to History's Greatest Lover, it sold three times that. And Fleeces of Gold sold 5,000 copies. When he changed the title to Quest for a Blonde Mistress, it sold 50,000 copies, 10 times more. So it is worth asking yourself, does your ad or does your message tap into one of these desires? Are you offering something that will improve your customer and showcasing how the customer will improve in your ads and in your story? Because if you're not, then you're probably missing an opportunity. But what examples do we have of major multinational brands with thousands of employees telling a compelling yet consistent story? Well, I asked JJ for an example. Let's let's use Apple as an example. When they first came out with the their first like desktop at home computer, the computer was actually named after Steve Jobs' daughter. So it was really right there. And that was kind of an inside thing. So it was all about the company. And then Apple took out this ad in the New York Times that talked about all of the f- features of the product over and over and over. I mean, it was just like a list. It was a huge thing of like all the stuff it could do. And basically it was only for computer nerds, all the processing it could do, all the tools it had over and over and over again. And 
it didn't sell. It actually was a disaster. And Steve Jobs ends up leaving Apple and going to Pixar. (laughs) While he's at Pixar, he ends up obviously understanding how story works. And he, you know, they, they spend a year or two just developing a story for a film before they even start at animation. And he under, begins to understand how story works and why story is powerful. He comes back to Apple and then you start seeing a complete shift in how Apple sells their products. It becomes all about the customer. And there's this commercial that Apple would use that has like black and white images of like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and mother Teresa that, and there's this, there's this voiceover of the top of it that goes the outcasts, the misfits, the misunderstood, right? (laughs) It had zero to do with their computers at all, their product at all. It talked about essentially how when you become part of the Apple tribe or you begin begin using Apple products, these will help you be seen. These will help you be heard. This will help you create. They will help you become who you are supposed to be. So they really focused the story on the customer versus the product. The product was amazing, but when they told all of the features and benefits, that's the wrong story to tell. When you position the customer as the hero, it's different. And then what was interesting to me is actually after Steve Jobs had passed, they launched, I believe it was after he had passed, they launched the Apple Watch. And I saw the very first Apple Watch commercials went back to focusing on the product. They were like, you're this, you know, keeps time in this way. And it understands your heartbeat and it does it talked about all the features and how cool the product was and the first launch bombed then if you now look at apple watches it's how does this watch help you live your life it's not about the watch at all it's about your ability to run it's about your ability to create it's about your ability to stay connected with people that's it now i think that's all well and good for big brands with big budgets But what if you're a small brand, a local cafe, or a small photography company? How can you come up with a great story? I asked JJ. I see this with companies all the time, even when like you go to an about us page or a bio of somebody who's on your staff. I was working with a dentist office recently, and the dentist office decided to change their stories in their bios from being they used to say, you know, this girl was a three point champion in college and she has three kids. Her favorite ice cream flavor is vanilla. And we think when we do things like that, when we're talking in our bio that we're trying to make connection with people, but really we're not really telling their story. We're telling our story. They want to hear their story. So instead of saying I was a three point champion, what they say is in their bio, they say something like, um, my passion is about helping people overcome blank. So it's little tweaks that businesses can do, small or big businesses, by positioning your customer as the hero and telling that story are going to make a huge difference in how people engage. On an earlier episode of Nudge, I shared an interesting study with Company Tours. In experiments, customers who had been on a tour of a company's premises were 32% more likely to buy from that company. Just Seeing behind the scenes and learning about the company's story through a tour made customers 32% more likely to buy. But like JJ says, it's vital that that story speaks to the customer. It needs to be about them to make them interested in it. Because if they're not interested, the story will fail. To finish up, here's JJ sharing an experiment of a brand launch with a huge celebrity endorsement and massive advertising spend that failed. And it failed because their story was wrong. It was interesting because when Jay-Z launched Tidal, the music streaming service, he launched it with all of these stars on stage, these millionaires who we all saw as millionaires, Kanye and Lady Gaga and Beyonce. They're all up there and they're millionaires. And their story was about how streaming services are ripping off artists. And it did not go well. The launch didn't go well because I'm sitting there going, oh, so I want to give more money to millionaires? Is that really, that's what that's this problem that this solves and so it didn't it didn't go well in the beginning because there was no story about me as a consumer it was all about them they made the story about i guess you're supporting artists when you use this service but no streaming services are a commodity 
So you need to show me how it makes, how it adds value to my life. And if you don't, then I'm going for the cheaper product. Because if you can't show me the value differentiation for my story, then I'm sorry, I'm going for cheap. But if you can actually communicate more clearly why this is important for me, why I'm the hero of this story, how it benefits me, what's your plan for me that is different than me listening to somebody else, now I'll pay a little bit more to be a part of that streaming service because I can see, oh, there's the value in my that uh, that the story that I'm going to live out by being a part of this. But if you make it all about title and about Kanye and about Beyonce becoming more rich because streaming services are ripping them off, I don't care. I don't care about that. That doesn't help me live a better life. Despite huge investment and celebrity endorsements that even the biggest brands couldn't dream of, Tidal failed. They spent millions to launch and market their product, but they never captured more than 2% market share for streaming music platforms. I think the important part of Tidal's story is that no one wants to put more money in the pockets of multimillionaires, so, so the platform didn't take off. Now, you can compare that to Spotify. Spotify is all about you. Discover Weekly showcases a curated playlist of music just for you. Spotify Wrapped shares your year in review. And Spotify's weekly suggestions tell you about upcoming performances for artists you love. Tidal was all about what the celebrities wanted, and arguably Spotify is all about what you want. And perhaps that is why Spotify has won. All right, folks, that is all for today's episode of Nudge. If you like today's show, then you will love episode 40 of Nudge. It is called What Makes a Great Story. It's a cracker. You'll learn the storytelling tactic that made Star Wars a success, how researchers tripled sales on eBay by telling better stories, and a campaign that made millions of Americans start paying for bottled water. I've left a link to that show in the show notes, so so go click there to listen, or just go and search for episode 40 on wherever you get your podcasts. I want to say a massive thank you for JJ for coming on the show. There's links to his company, Storyband, and his book in the show notes. I'd especially encourage you to go and listen to his show, Marketing Made Simple. It's a cracker and a real must-listen for any marketer. If you like today's show, then please consider signing up for my newsletter. Just head to nudgepodcast.com and click newsletter in the menu. If you do, you'll get a psychology-inspired tip in your inbox every week. You can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Just search for Phil Agnew. That's Phil, A-G-N-E-W, and you'll find me on there. And that is all for this week. Thank you so much for listening to Nudge. I'll be back next week with another episode. Cheers.